Hey everybody, it's T. I'm so excited to be sitting here with you today and I pray and hope that this is a blessing to you. I'm going to be speaking on the topic of the Christian life and I want to start with a definitive statement that I believe to be true and that is that the entire Christian life, the entire Christian walk is a call to action. And I want to start by differentiating and going through what definitive statements are versus commands or calls to action. And I'm going to be reading the definitions to you, not because I think you're ignorant or because I think you're stupid or anything like that, but it's just for the record. So what is a call to action? Let's go ahead and read by definition what a call to action is. A call to action is the part of your message that tells your audience, so in this case, the message would be the word of God, that tells your audience what to do, right? This is a call to action. I also want to read the definition. This is going to be straight from the KJV dictionary. The definition of a command. Command. To bid, to order, to direct, to charge, and to require obedience. Now, with that said, I'm going to be immediately going to a verse in the Bible. And we're going to talk about this verse in regards to obedience until salvation. Because the very first step to even being able to walk the Christian walk or live the Christian life is to become a Christian. And how do you become a Christian? How do you become a believer or a child of God? We will start with Acts chapter 3 verse 19, which reads, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of of our Lord. The beginning of this verse is in fact a call to action. It is a verb command. It is repent, repent. We are in now Romans 10 verse 16, which reads, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Now, do you see how the call to action of repent, right? Believe the gospel, change your mind from unbelief to belief. Do we see here how that is tied in with obedience. We are not obeying the gospel if we are not believing the gospel. This is where Romans 10 verse 16 makes perfect sense that in order for them not to obey the gospel, they would have first needed a call to action. Very, very simple stuff here, guys. But I just, I'm again, I'm just saying this for the record. This is showing us very plainly that we all have a choice to obey the gospel or not. We all have a choice to come to repentance, to believe the, the message of the gospel. We are also commanded or exhorted. And it reads, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There are many calls to action even after coming to salvation, right? Once we are saved, the entire Christian walk is a call to action. So it's not only in the very beginning, right? The call to action to believe the gospel, but it doesn't stop there. The entire, I will repeat it again, the entire Christian walk, the entire Christian life is a call to action but there are also many definitive statements within the Bible. And let's just go ahead and go to the very first definitive statement that I believe that we should rest in. No pun intended. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and read Hebrews chapter 4. So this is not a call to action. This is obviously not a command. This is a definitive statement in which the writer of Hebrews says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Here is an identification truth. Here is a truth that we reckon to be true. So we are able to move on to the call to action. Now let's continue to read. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. A definitive statement. 
Now here is the call to action in verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. We need to reckon the identification truth as true. We need to believe what is being said here so we are able to walk in God's ways by faith. And then it goes on to read, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. These definitive truths lead to the call to action. Because this is the truth, do this. Because this is who you are, walk like this. Because we know who we are. And in this case, we know that we are resting in the finished work of the cross. And we know that we are safe and secure in Christ Jesus. And we have a high priest who is always, always for us and making intercession on our behalf. Like we are so blessed. We are so incredibly blessed. Let's go to verse 16. Let us therefore, right? Here's the call to action followed by this definitive statement. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So here's the first call to action that I see in, in the life of a believer. And that is to reckon the truth of our identification to be true and to rest in the fact that we are seated in heavenly places. And the call to action is to believe that we can go boldly to the throne of grace. We don't need to, to sacrifice an animal. We don't need to go speak with a priest and confess all our sins before we can go to the Father. No, Jesus is our high priest, right? And we can go to him at any time boldly, boldly in our time of need when we need help in any case, right? So not only when our, our conscience is, is bothering us, but also when we need help, when we need strength, when we need guidance, we can go straight to Jesus Christ at any time because the veil has been torn, right? We're not living in, in old covenant uh, ordinances where you couldn't even go back into the Holy of Holies, right? Without doing all of these ordinances and, and all these sacrifices and whatnot, we can go straight to Jesus Christ. And there is the call to action here. The call to action is to go boldly to the throne of grace. The call to action, right? The, uh, the definitive statement is, is leading to that call to action by the knowledge of, of the truth of the word. So with that said, what are some of the other calls to action within the New Testament? We see so many commands. We see here in Titus 2.6, be sober-minded, right? We see in Acts 2.38 to be baptized. This is a command, be baptized. We see in John 16.33, be of good cheer. We see in Romans 12.12, 12, be patient in tribulation. We see in Romans 12.13, be given it to hospitality. We see here in Philippians 4.6, be anxious for nothing. We see in 1 Peter 5.3, be examples of the flock. We see in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, be subject one to another. We see 1 Peter 5.5, 5, be clothed in humility. We see Revelation 3.2, be watchful, strengthen yourself. We see in Revelation 3 verse 19, be zealous and repent. This repentance is, is speaking to the church in regards to a sin not in regards to salvation itself. We see so many bewares through scripture. We see beware of false prophets in Matthew 7, 15. 
we see in 1 Timothy 1, 4, do not give heed to fables. Like these, these are just examples of calls to action. These are examples of commands that we are being given. And the reason why we don't cancel out human volition and we don't cancel out free will is because the moment that we do that, then we call God's word confusing and it's not confusing the word of god is absolutely not confusing he is not going to command or tell us to do something in the christian life in the christian walk as believers if we are not even able to do those things we are only able to do these things because they have been followed by a definitive statement meaning that we already have been given the means to do these things by the spirit because we are children of god we have the holy spirit in the spirit we always have perfect fellowship with christ this is why the entire christian walk is a call to action because he has made us a new creature right this is a definitive statement that we need to actually read and here is the definitive statement that we must reckon true and beware of any false teacher that tries to tell us that we are not, in fact, this, as God says, that we are, which is 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is a definitive statement about our identity. We are a new creature in Christ. The flesh has been crucified and our spiritual man has been made brand new. And we are seated in heavenly places. We are new. Everything about our spirit has become new. This is why we are told, serve in singleness of heart because we have a new spiritual heart. We don't want to be double-minded, right? Or walking in the old carnal mind or heart versus the new spiritual mind or heart this is why jesus says serve in singleness of heart and that verse is in colossians three twenty two, which reads servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh not with eye services men pleasers but in singleness of heart fearing god why are we being told to serve in singleness of heart it is because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And we need to mind the things of the spirit. We need to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, right? Not in the old carnal mind, but the new. So that is the call to action to walk in the spirit. So we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The entire Christian walk is a call to action to believe who we are in Christ. So that we can do the things that the word tells us that we need to be doing.